Doctor Who's 16th season would attempt something very new. Six stories would form part of an overarching plot that played out over 26 episodes. And it's not the search for Tom Baker's chill, but the search for the key to time. The 1978-79 season of Doctor Who was producer Graham Williams' second year as showrunner, and after the tumult of the previous season, the 16th season would be slightly less fraught. But not entirely fraught-free. There would still be enough frauts to go around. Frauts for everyone. Chiefly, Tom Baker, now in his fifth year in the role, was subsuming the show with his ego, personality, whims and moods, and Graham Williams found keeping his star under control more and more difficult. Less difficult was his working relationship with script editor Anthony Ree, who'd been a producer himself in the past. That could be very useful. And together they shaped an idea that Williams had wanted to develop for a while, a season where each story was one chapter in a larger overall plot. The Time Lords had been the show's go-to all-powerful beings, but over time, they became much more mortal and normal. They could regenerate and travel through time, sure, but they couldn't shoot flames from their fingertips or walk upside down on ceilings, at least not while sober. So in came the Guardians as new, even more all-powerful beings above the Time Lords in power rankings. There's a White Guardian of Light and his opposite number, the infinitely cooler Black Guardian of Darkness and Chaos. It's a bit binary, but then so is the Alpha Centauri star system. The Doctor is tasked by the White Guardian to find the six segments of the key to time, with the Doctor able to opt out, just like websites that ask for your cookies and then delete your hard drive if you say no. Or is that just me? You want me to volunteer, isn't that it? Precisely. And if I don't? Nothing. You mean nothing will happen to me? Nothing at all. Ever. The key to time itself was merely a MacGuffin, a rather cool way to link six stories. The actual stories of the key to time season would more or less follow the usual style of plot, though obviously the arc was more important to the first and last stories of the season, with occasional recaps throughout the season for casual viewers. But first up, they needed a new companion. My name is Romana Dvoratna Lunda. I'm so sorry about that. Is there anything we can do? Romana Dvoratra Lunda was a young Time Lord, a recent graduate of the Academy, and basically an unpaid intern. She's been forced on the Doctor by the Guardian. Romana is confident, but lacking in real world, or more accurately, real universe experience. So she's only qualified for two jobs, the Doctor's assistant or Director General of the BBC. I'll call you Romana. I don't like Romana. It's either Romana or Fred. All right, call me Fred. Romana has academic qualifications superior to those of the Doctor, and she's not shy about time lording it over him. Well, it's better than scraping through with 51% at the second attempt. That information is confidential. Or just using withering sarcasm. It's funny, you know, but before I met you, I was even willing to be impressed. Romana seems to be based heavily on Rodan from the previous year's Invasion of Time, an intelligent time lord given menial jobs. Mary Tam was cast as Romana, an intelligent actress given a dull menial job. Tam brought a touch of glamour to the series. Romana was conceived of as an ice queen, but without the annoying songs. Romana's naivete is quite pronounced at the start of the series, and Tam herself seems a little stiff at first. But he had such an honest face. Romana, you can't be a successful crook with a dishonest face. But she gradually grows into the role as the season progresses, getting us closer to a companion who, in some ways, is on the same level intellectually as the Doctor. Always believe the best until you find out exactly what the situation's all about. Then believe the worst. Ah, but what happens if it turns out not to be the worst after all? Don't be ridiculous, it always is. K9 continues this season, along with John Leeson as his voice. She is prettier than you, Master. But technically it's K9 Mark II, but crucially it's still John Leeson Mark I. The reboss operation by Robert Holmes opens up the season, and within a few minutes has already introduced the audience to The Guardians, explained the season's MacGuffin, and acquaints the audience with Romana. It's not an epic story, but a studio-bound show about two con men trying to sell the planet Reboss to a mentally unstable deposed dictator, as if there's any other kind. In this case, the Graf Vindicay. There aren't huge action scenes or world-shattering events, just the Doctor and Romana trying to stay alive after the Graf decides everyone is out to get him. The story is Robert Holmes giving pages of rich dialogue to the rogue Garen, while the Doctor tries to break in a new assistant. There's no comfort in dying. 
I've always said it was the last thing I want to do. The lack of visual ambition works since the story is easily written within the series' capabilities with only the monster of the week, the Shrivenzal, not really working as intended. I'll try and remember that. Good. And don't be sarcastic either. That can also get you into trouble. The key to time itself has been split into six segments across space and time, but they've been disguised as ordinary objects, which gives viewers the added bonus of watching the Doctor and Romana try and work out what the segment is, while viewers at home try to do exactly the same. I just bet it's that bloody stone. So you can now get out your Stam Fine Key to Time bingo card and play along at home. You mean it was disguised as the Jethric all along? Yes. I thought you'd have realised that, bright girl like you. The pirate planet does have a more conceptually epic feel, but in a way that the series budget was stretched just enough that it doesn't look terrible, but far enough that it doesn't always look great. Written by Douglas Adams, yes, that Douglas Adams, who was commissioned to write four episodes of Doctor Who at around the same time he was meant to finish work on a bunch of scripts for his radio series, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. I had an air car rather like this once. It was a present for my 70th birthday. The Doctor and Romana think they've located the second segment on the planet Calufrax, but instead find themselves on the planet Zanak, a place where precious gems litter the streets like discarded AOL discs. By all the suns that blaze, I'll tear you apart! Molecule from molecule. The ruler of Zanak, the captain, is a blustery cyborg, complete with a robot parrot that shits out laser blasts to disintegrate anyone who displeases the captain, which is most people. The pirate analogy is taken further when the doctor discovers that Zanak is hollow. Your entire planet jumps through space. Those engines! Yes, those engines, huge enough to dematerialize an entire hollow planet, flip it halfway across the galaxy, and rematerialize it around its chosen prey. The pirate planet is full of inventive set pieces and also filled with science fiction cliches. And prejudice fight. By every last breath in my body, you'll be avenged. Like a cosplay convention where everyone is Spider Man. It is not a toy! What's it for? <gasps> what are you doing? Whenever Adams needs to do serious plot or add some character development, he leans on cliches more often than the entire run of Sequest DSV. Why? 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 Oh, Eula, don't spoil everything. But the plot is outlandish and the jokes fly thick and fast, just like the laser turds from the robot parrot. I like the pirate planet, but I don't know if I could take an entire season of Doctor Who with Douglas Adams' brand of humour in every story. What's that you say? Tom Baker's got a wound on his lip in the early stories from when a dog bit him on the lip. Also around this time, K9 began attending anger management classes. Stones of Blood is the season's bona fide classic and would be the last sort of gothic horror show that the series would attempt for a very long time. The Doctor and Romana land on present day Earth near a series of stone megaliths where they encounter Professor Rumford and her companion Vivian Fay. If you travelled more than 180,000 miles per second, you'd encounter the time distortion effect. Yes, yes, well it's nearly right. There are some druids worshipping a Celtic goddess, the Kaliak, doing druidy things like scrapbooking, decoupage, and of course, ritual sacrifice. But they are very quickly written out of the story after being killed by a vampiric stone megalith. In the cause of science, I think it's our duty to capture that creature. Come on! Hovering over the stone circle in hyperspace is a vessel full of corpses and the story takes a sharp left turn when the Doctor is put on trial by some floating sparkly stuck pixels called the Megara, all powerful justice machines hunting for their own prisoner. I am Vivian Fay of Rose Cottage, Boscow, and ask anyone in Boscow and they will identify me. These proceedings must now be terminated. Stones of Blood by new writer David Fisher is confident and well made, full of sparkling performances and sharp dialogue. The Ogre, despite having as much expression as, I don't know, Adric, are an interesting idea that works quite well within the show's budget. What doesn't work? The Megara, realised as malfunctioning Christmas tree lights. They're probably the only thing that lets the show down. They just about work thanks to the voice work and willing suspension of disbelief. And also, as a viewer, vodka-soaked cupcakes do help an awful lot. I shall, of course, Your Honour, dispense with the oath. You certainly will. The Megara cannot lie. Well, that's handy. 
By this point, Mary Tam had become comfortable in the role of Romana and her performance was by now far less stiff than the initial episodes. Help me move this rock, canine. Oh, it's no good, it won't budge. Her playfully antagonistic banter with the Doctor and still quite pronounced naivete about adventuring have grown into a fairly interesting and unique character. So by now, the bingo card is half complete and the first half of the season has been pretty good so far. So how does the rest of the season hold up? Androids of Tara, also by David Fisher, is Doctor Who riffing on the prisoner of Zender, with the Doctor and Romana landing on a planet and finding the fourth segment within the first few minutes, but then they get caught up in a tale of intrigue revolving around various plots to use androids to take the throne of Tara. There are three roles for Mary Tam in this, Romana, the Princess Strella, and an android version of Strella, with the kicker being that if you can tell which is which, you win a prize. You can see how Tom Baker has lost all confidence in this script, where he sends it up rotten, like a shipment of army surplus durian bound for a space station. On Tara, the peasants build and maintain the androids, while the nobles wear silly hats. I mean, really, really silly hats. Crown an android king of Tara! Never! It sort of works for the most part, but ultimately feels a bit slight, like flying over the Atlantic in a 747 made of balsa wood. One man alone? No, no, no. One man and his dog. Androids of Tara seems like a good idea that didn't really do enough with the concept. Next time, I shall not be so lenient! It's a solid story that sort of just melts into the background, unnoticed, like an FBI spy at Woodstock. Talking of forgetting things, where's K-9? Where's K-9? Master! Master! Power of Crawl ended up being Robert Holmes' last script for Doctor Who for several years, and it's a very average tale of some displaced natives possibly about to be displaced again. I'll try a pitch higher. What? Power of Crawl as a story was infamous, but it's now not as infamous as it once was. I've seen it! It's hostile! Crawl itself is a giant squid and about as good as it was going to be for the 70s. Originally, the join between the model shots and the live action plates was about as obvious as a finance minister talking about finding efficiencies in healthcare. Probably the usual things. Fire, water, hanging upside down over a pit of vipers. That's only three. The natives, known as the Swampies, are a bunch of well-spoken lovies, cosplaying as Kermit the Frog. It's not easy being green Having to spend each day the colour of the leaves When I think there's a whacking great giant squid called Pro Who's trying to eat all of us <laughs> Humans aren't all that much better, one of them being John Leeson, ordinarily the voice of K-9. No one in their right mind thought trying to make K-9 work in a swamp was a good idea, so he was left in the TARDIS and Leeson, already under contract, got his face on screen. For those of you keeping score at home, the key to time has been a lump of the mineral Jethric, the planet Calufrax, a pendant, a stone statue, and an ancient relic of the swampies that had been swallowed by a giant squid. That brings us nicely to the sixth and final segment of the key to time. Whatever it is. What are bees? Insects. What stings in their tails? The Armageddon Factor by Bob Baker and Dave Martin, their last script for the series as a writing duo, sees the Doctor and Romana searching for the final segment in the midst of a nuclear war between two planets, Atrios and Zaos. While the Doctor and Romana had been traipsing across the universe for the White Guardian, the Black Guardian has just skipped to the end. Now, Doctor, you are completely in my power. Do you mean because of that? <laughs> His proxy, a guy called The Shadow, has manipulated events to force the Doctor's hand. The sixth segment is a person, the Princess Astra, and there's a slightly dodgy Time Lord, Drax, hanging about. This is also one of the few times that this happens. There'll be a rather large bang, big enough to blow up Zeos, take Atreus with it, and make certain the whole thing ends in a sort of draw. That's the way these military minds work. The Armageddon Factor. 
Baker and Martin scripts are always full of interesting sci-fi ideas, often beyond the ability of the BBC to realise them effectively. A lot of the most interesting stories with overly ambitious effects of the 1970s that didn't pan out often tended to be from this writing pair. A great moment here is the Doctor making a fake sixth piece of the key to time to temporarily use the power of the key to set up a time loop that puts on ice a computer that's about to blow up both planets and halts the leader of Atrios, the warmongering Marshal, from launching a nuclear assault on Zeos. Fancy that! time travel being used in an interesting way in a series about time travellers, but it's something that you rarely saw in classic Doctor Who, like an airport that doesn't sell Toblerone. You shall give us our victory. Yes! But listen, before I do, what happens if I don't? The question doesn't arise. Oh, well. <laughs> parts of the Armageddon factor hold up really well, and some parts a little slapdash. On the whole, it came together very well for a studio-bound story from the late 70s. For a show with a lot of running around between Atrios, Zeos and the Shadow Satellite in between, they make great use of a matter transmitter to teleport people here, there and everywhere. For whatever reason, these planets all use the exact same Transmac technology, all seemingly supplied by the flashing strobe light seizure generating company of Tau Ceti. Jax, I got one to private. Where did you acquire this peculiar vocabulary? Brixton, eh? Brixton? Brixton, London, Earth. Some people hate the Doctor's schoolmate Drax, I suppose because of the accent, but it's interesting to see an ex-Time Lord who, while he's not 100% reliable, is not actually evil. You did well, mind getting your doctorate and all that. The Shadow, played by Cullen's ex-boss William Squire, goes full-on cartoon villain here. You fool, Doctor. The key to time is mine. <laughs> The key to time arc doesn't end with a massive epic scene, but as a bit of an anticlimax. Because I can do anything, as from this moment there's no such thing as free will in the entire universe. There's only my will because I possess the key to time. Doctor, are you all right? Well, of course I'm all right. The Doctor outwits the Black Guardian and scatters the segments again. It would be a terrible tragedy for the universe if it suddenly turned out that I was colorblind. Doctor, you shall die for this! Returning Astra to life in the process, in a scene apparently written by incoming script editor Douglas Adams. By this time, the TARDIS had become too reliable, and the producers decided to shake things up. Uh, well, it's called a uh, randomizer, and it's fitted to the guidance systems and operates under a very complex scientific principle called potluck. Mary Tam had already made the decision that she was not going to continue for another season. You're capricious, arrogant, self-opinionated, irrational, and you don't even know where we're going. And canine voice actor John Leeson was also moving on. Master. Leaving producer Graham Williams the task of having to recast both of the Doctor's companions without creating new characters in the process. Season 16 was a solid upgrade from the inconsistent nature of scripts and production difficulties of the previous season. No stories were outright terrible, and apart from the giant squid, it's a year that's fairly free of super embarrassing special effects. The key to time was an enjoyable romp, but the production team felt it was pushing the patience of viewers having a story unfold over 26 episodes. Season 16 was by and large relatively untroubled compared to the previous year, but the forthcoming 17th season would be incredibly difficult. Actually, that's really underselling the challenges ahead for Doctor Who. But here, in this little, little room. Get on with it, Doctor. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, leave a comment below, or check out some of our other videos.